Okay, so as Dr. Jenna said, we're gonna talk about graft versus host disease after solid organ transplant, and I called it, what do we know? Because honestly, it's not a lot. So we're gonna go over the things we know. So no disclosures. So why I am, am I talking about the uh, graft versus host disease after stem cell transplant? It's very rare, the incidence, it depends on what organ we're transplanting, but it, it ranges from 5.6% in small intestine to uh, one to two percent in liver transplant and less in other organs. And we'll talk about why. It depends mainly on the number of lymphocytes in those organs transplanted. But it has a real serious complication. Mortality is actually approaches more like being 90% um, because a lot of these people die of opportunistic infections from the panspermia that they get from the graft versus host disease. And most importantly, we have to have very high index of suspicion, early diagnosis and starting the treatment is very, very important. And that's what I'm gonna stress in this lecture. So what is graft versus host disease? So most of our knowledge is related to, as Dr. Jenna said, stem cell transplant, not really the organ transplant, solid organ transplant. But since 1966, we know that we need um, a donor graft that's uh, active and uh, immunologically competent, and then recipients that cannot uh, um, fight this uh, donor, which is immunosuppressed, and then some difference between the two. So if the uh, donor cells are more active than the recipient, then we will have graft versus host disease. If it's the opposite, we will have rejection. So this is the well-known cycle for graft versus host disease after stem cell transplant. So I'm gonna talk about the pathophysiology of GPHT after stem cell transplant, and from this we will go to organ, solid organ transplant. So there are three steps uh, for GPHT after stem cell transplant. One um, is damage to the tissues, mainly intestine with the high conditioning regimens or the chemotherapy radiation that we give. That cause some cytokines, including tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1, 6. That cause activation of T cells, which, um, which happens after the interaction between uh, APCs, the um, uh, the cells that present the antigens to the T cells, and then that also <coughs> causes more cytokines like interferon gamma and interleukin-2, which stimulates the effector cells like NK cells and cytotoxic T cells to cause more damage and so on. So this is kind of what I think is, we, it actually took us a long time to get to this cycle to know what's going on from, with the GVHD pathophysiology, but also I think it took us also a long time to go from this to the next step. So it's, it's not as simple, it's more complicated and there are more other issues involved. So the activated T cells and the T cells interaction, not only just the T cells with uh, major histocompatibility, if they interact with each other, nothing gonna happen without the other uh, receptors in the T cells. Um, and then after these T cells get activated, there are other stuff that's gonna happen, including the T cell proliferation. So there, here there are a lot of options in the future, including CD1, CTLA4, to hopefully help us in uh, treatment or uh, prophylaxis in graft versus host disease. Also, the T cell proliferation is important in the process or how GVHD occurs. T cell proliferation, now we know that cyclophosphamide that we give after uh, infusing the stem cells can prevent the proliferation of activated T cells while not affecting the uh, antiviral T cells, and that's the idea of post-transplant psi after the haplo stem cell transplant. And then trafficking of the T cells. It's very important for some receptors uh, for the T cell trafficking to go to the tissues and cause damage in those tissue, tissues, including CCR5 and other molecules, and that's where the Maraviroc comes, and now we, uh, which is started as anti-HIV medication, and now it's being used for prophylaxis, or at least in clinical trial, for prophylaxis and treatment of GVHD. And then the other cytokines and other like uh, receptors that cause the damage to the cells. So these are some of the mediators of GVHD that I wanna tell you a little bit about. I'm not gonna go into details, it's a busy slide, but mainly I wanna talk a little bit about T-helper one, T-helper two, and T-rex, which gonna help me explain certain things in the rest of the lecture. So I put the help one in red because this is bad for graft versus host disease. All these cytokines will cause more acute GVHD. However, T helper two, um, it's actually, at least for the acute GVHD, not the, the chronic GVHD, is kind of a good thing. 
And then Tregs it kind of suppress the process of ATG-based genes. So what about after solid organ transplant? It's kind of the same three steps that we talked about, um, but of course, what tissue damage? I mean, we give radiation chemotherapy in stem cell transplant, but they think that it's related probably to surgery, immune suppressive agents, infection. It might start with viral or bacterial infection and then causing the damage will stimulate the process that we, talk, we talked about, the cytokine, TNF, interferon gamma, the APCs will stimulate the T cells, go into T helper one, um, and then more tumor necrosis factors, and then the effector cells, which will cause damage, and then we'll go again to the cycle. Uh, <clears throat> so GBSP after organ transplant is largely dependent on number of uh, immune competent T cells. So I just want to mention uh, the number of T cells uh, 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 transplanted in the organs. So as I said, it's small, more in small intestine and then in the liver and then after that the kidney and the other organs because they say that possibly around 10 to the power 9 to the 10 to the power 10 donor lymphocytes are transplanted with small intestine or liver transplant, which is very close to actually what, what we transplant in uh, stem cell, cell transplants, but less in other organs. Um, um, some people say that the kind of um, the safe number of donor lymphocytes to, trans to transfuse or transplant is 10 to the power 3, 10 to the power 5. So if this is actually a number very similar to the stem cell transplant, then we should see a larger number or percentage of people getting, or patients getting liver transplant and small intestine transplant, well, like our uh, stem cell transplant, 50% of people get GBSP. But in liver transplant, they get only one to 2% and some even report less, which could be related to under reporting. But it's probably related to the composite of these T cells in the liver or intestinal uh, transplant. So in the peripheral blood, CD4 is more than CD8, and T helper one is more than T helper two. But in liver uh, and intestines, usually CD8 is more than CD4, and they have more CD56 T cells, positive T cells, and then the T, T helper two are more. And I, I told you before, the cytokine for T helper two is kind of good for acute GBHP, so it could be related to that. So this is about the pathophysiology. Now let's talk about how to diagnose. So we have clinical symptoms, pathology, and then uh, presence of chimerism. So signs and symptoms. So the, uh, the cells or T cells will affect the skin, the intestines, and bone marrow. So skin, it will cause rashes, intestine, it's gonna go into diarrhea, and then for the bone marrow, it's gonna cause hypoplasia. This is some of the pictures uh, for some patients with uh, uh, GPHD after the liver transplant. So some of these um, early presentation is fever and rash. Fever can occur in 60% of these patients. Rash can occur um, uh, in 94%, but some people like 15% of patients can just have rash. Um, so only 15% can still rash, but most of them do progress if left untreated to have you know, diarrhea and cytopenias and so on. Typically occurs, it's very important, two to eight weeks, and we're gonna talk more about this timing. But is it, this is the timing when most of the T cells from the donor is floating in the blood and then will go to the tissue of those patients. So it's normal to have up to two weeks some kind of chimerism, which is combination of T cells from the donor and the recipient, um, or in this case, in the organ transplant, is the donor T cells uh, for up to two weeks and then they start to go down. Even if symptom, even asymptomatic patient, they can still have up to four weeks, but anything after that, this is GBHD. So that's why this is the timing. So it's very important to remember on those patients around this time, if they have fever, if they have rash, you know, start thinking of GBHD. Um, but of course there are some patients like kidney transplant, they, there are some case reports of late onset, but this is the most common time of presentation. So rash, 95% of patients get the rash, can usually macular papular, can progress to bullying and disclamation. Bone marrow occurs in 54 for half of the patients because the T cells, they go to the bone marrow, they cause the cytopenia, and this is often a very bad prognosis because then you go into vicious cycle of cytopenias, infections, and so on. Diarrhea, it occurs also in 54% of the patients because it's infiltration, uh, the lymphocyte infiltrates the intestine, decreases the absorption, and that's how they get diarrhea. Now, liver enzymes, it's not gonna happen in a liver transplant patient because the donor is not gonna attack its liver, but it can happen in any other solid organ transplant. So this is just, I'm not gonna go through the exact uh, pathology in the, uh, uh, in the biopsies, but I just at least put the 
at least trigger of the uh, grade one and grade grade five, uh, four. I'm sorry. So basically, vacuumation in the in the skin and then separation of dermis and epidermis in stage uh, four. Very important to remember, this is not specific for GVAC, and we're going to talk about it. It can occur with other infections, other other problems, other drug reactions can happen the same, but um, it at least triggers the diagnosis, but it's not uh, specific just for GVHD. Same thing for GI. You can see crypt apoptosis. So in the biopsy, you have to make sure there are crypts to say if there's crypt apop apoptosis. And then there are also grading I'm not going to go through, but uh, basically there's apoptosis depending on the number of apoptotic figures and the um, abscesses and so on. Um, one thing I want to mention is that not everybody needs to get uh, GI biopsy. It's, it's not recommended as a screening, only if they have symptoms. And this is also not specific for GVHD. Any, uh, like MMF itself can cause this problem. Infection can cause this or, uh, picture, so it's not specific. So we don't need to do it for everybody, only if they have symptoms. So as I said, this is the, uh, can be seen in a lot of um, other uh, problems, like viral infection can cause the skin rash, CMV. Um, the biopsy can be similar in the skin like erythema multiforme or other drugs induced to skin rashes. GI symptoms, as I said, CMV, uh, uh, C. diff can cause diarrhea. MMF can cause typical picture of apoptotic uh, or crypt apoptosis. So what can help us other than, so first uh, timing, you know, early symptoms, uh, we get the pathology, and then uh, next step is the chimerism. So the chimerism, as I said, to detect how much uh, donor cells we have, uh, as again, as I said, in the presence of symptoms. And uh, we said uh, if the first two, two weeks we have the peak and then they start going down, it's normal. But if uh, there's GVAC, they would persist. So chimeras, we are looking at genetic variation. There are different types of ge genetic variation that we can look at. There's the uh, substitute of one nucleotide, which is the SNP, the single nucleotide polymorphism, and insertion or deletion or more than, uh, of more than one nucleotide, which is the tandem repeats that we're going to talk about, and there's other insertion deletion. But mainly, we're going to talk about the tandem repeats and the STR. So basically, the STR, as you know, so multiple sequence of DNA can be different in numbers. Uh, and this is um, even the, it's like finger prints. They can use it in forensic medicine, also in the STR for us to know uh, donor recipient. So um, this is an example, like a donor and a recipient. So we have different repeats, six and four. The recipient will have eight and six. And then with the PCR, we will know, depending on the area under the curve, we can do the calculation and see how much recipient, and so recipient has this, this one here, the donor has here. If you go, this is an example of post symptom transplant. So you have the combination of two, and then we calculate the recipient depending on the areas under the curve. This is just, I want to show you how much sensitive this is. So this is in a, in a male to male, sorry, uh, male uh, and female donor recipient, so sex mismatch, and you can see it, it detects up to 1%. Less than not, not it's not going to detect it. So it is sex independent, it's sensitivity 1%, and high. high quantification capacity. So this is an example in a patient who got liver transplant. So this is another uh, sex mismatch transplant. So we can see the difference between this is for fish, um, one of the options that we can use. Um, uh, so you can see the uh, difference between Y, X and Y chromosomes. And this is the recipient uh, bone marrow. So there is, uh, uh, the recipient is a female, the donor is a male, X and Y. And then you can see in the peripheral blood there's combination X, Y, and you can see from the others there's combination of both. However, I want to show you something that it's not always in the peripheral uh, blood that you see the chimeras. So this is uh, actually five patients here from Henry Ford. So if you look at the peripheral STR, which is the first number, only one who had a positive STR in the peripheral blood, but all of them has a positive STR in, in the skin. So peripheral blood can still be negative while the affected organ can be still uh, positive. This is, I'm going to talk about risk factors in a minute. Okay, so we'll talk about risk factors. Um, so because of the numbers of the uh, solid organ transplant GVHD, most of these uh, risk factors are not, you know, uh, well studied because it's all re depending on the few case reports and retrospective data. But I started with the risk factors that kind of almost well known in the stem cell transplant. Female donor to, to male donor, 
So it is a risk factor in simple transplant. It is a risk factor in graft versus, uh, graft versus, graft versus disease after cold organ transplant because the Y chromosome is considered as like a SNP or as a minor antigen mismatch. So there's HY antigen that female donor T cells they recognize as foreign and they start fighting it. Also, most females, especially if they are uh, multiparous, they will have multiple cells that already activated and ready to attack the patient. So females are always the best patient and best caregiver, but not the best donors. <laughs> also because they listen and do follow instructions too. <laughs> okay, and then the age of the donor and recipient. So different between age uh, of the donor and recipient. So the older the um, recipient, which is the patient, uh, then the higher risk and or whenever there's difference between the two, there's higher risk for GBHD after cold organ transplant because with, um, when the recipient is old, they will have a less effective immune, immune system, so they will not be able to kind of clear the donor from their system. GI colonization is different and more, and I think, uh, I know I saw Dr. Dalbusta, I'm not sure of the other ID, but the microbial uh, uh, colonization is very important now in GBHD and the metabolites and all that stuff. There's whole research going on on this, and then less tissue repair and more active APCs in the uh, older patients. HLA mismatching and donor HLA homozygosity. So also this is kind of uh, known in stem cell transplant. Um, so if there is a, a patient who is almost a haplo, um, uh, 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 kind of a haplo or any, any an, uh, uh, allele that, or antigen that's a homozygous, so it's gonna be from, this is the donor, this is the recipient. So it's gonna be graft versus host disease direction. And I think I have a better, picture here. So this is an example of a donor who is HLA DR1, DR1. This is homozygous. Recipient is HLA DR1, DR2. So for the patient, HLA DR1, it's, it's not going to fight it, so there's not going to be any rejection. However, for the donor, HDR2 uh, is foreign, and that's going to be a risk for graft versus host disease. For whenever there is homozygosity in the donor, it's a high risk for graft versus host disease after uh, solid organ transplant. Then HLA matching, which is a little bit different than stem cell transplant. So for us, we like matching. We try to match them as much as possible. But there, is, there are some case reports that actually HLA matching in graft versus host disease for solid organ actually is bad. Because if there is really completely foreign, the uh, patient will try to fight those cells and kill them and reject them and get rid of them. However, if there is some matching, the more matching you have, looks like these uh, donor cells will try to live more in the in the patient and then eventually will cause more graft versus host disease. Then periorgan lymphoid tissue, we talked about that. And then others that are not, you know, only as, as I said, it's case report, not as documented, but I just wanna mention them like autoimmune hepatitis, combination with alcohol, liver disease, hepatic failure, carcinoma, glucose tolerance. And I think all kind of this is say that, you know, the patient is more immune suppressed than others. Others, uh, Caucasian HLA type, uh, HLA haplotype like A1, D8, DR17, also a risk factor for graft versus host disease. So actually, if we go back, and then infections like HSV, CMV could be related to the like startup of the process or after the process is very difficult to tell. So if we go here, so this, this patient had alcohol, HVC could be immune suppressed. This is a female to male, so this is a risk factor. This female was older, uh, and she had skin and bone marrow, and uh, actually uh, she died, and also the kind of uh, late uh, diagnosis of the GVHD. And four of these had actually homozygous HLA typing, and uh, number five had uh, the uh, common uh, Caucasian HLA haplotype that we talked about. So most of them had at least the risk factors mentioned. So treatment, also treatment, unfortunately, there's not a lot, it's very limited largely empirical, all case reports and case reviews, uh, nothing um, to say what specific thing to start, but steroids is something we use in stem cell transplant as the first line treatment, it's because apoptosis is a lymphocyte, uh, anti-inflammatory, so we do start it in, or at least most people agree that it should be started also in solid organ, graft versus host disease. Is it enough? It's not well known. Some people think it's more uh, the solid organ uh, GVHD is more resistant than just regular our stem cell transplant GVHD. Also, we have to remember that there is risk of infection. So 
if it's resistant, if it's risk of infection, then we should add something to help go down at least on the immune suppression. So uh, this is just to show you multiple options that Again, uh, we're trying to add in stem cell transplant, but I'm gonna mention for the solid organ transplant something we at least we're doing here for some of the patient, which is the anti-TNF, like infleximab, etanercept. Um, the difference is this is uh, uh, affect uh, the uh, soluble part of TNF and the receptors, but this is just the soluble part, so they think less risk of uh, infections, like especially fungal infections. Uh, this is just an example about one patient who got uh, Eternocept and steroids, I don't know if it's actually from far away, but basically this patient, she started to have cytopenia um, uh, and skin rash and fever. At first they did withdrawal of immune suppressor, which some people do that. Basically they're trying to, to uh, withdraw the immunity so, uh, of the uh, patient, so at least it will start to fight the, the donor and uh, try to get rid of it. But it's risky that you know, the patient might lose the organ because rejection. Uh, so it didn't work anyway in this patient, and then they added uh, steroids and uh, um, Eternocept, and the patient improved. This is a, uh, an example of one of the patients here, skin rash, and then bully. Uh, he was given steroids, and then uh, with not much improvement, or just mild improvement, then uh, he was given uh, Eternocept, improved, but at one point stabilized, so we started ECP. So what is ECP, which is extracorporeal uh, photophoresis? Basically, we take the blood from the patient uh, and then uh, we kind of separate the red blood cells goes back to the patient. We take the buffy coat with the uh, cells that we are interested in and um, we expose it to the ultraviolet light and put it back at the patient. What happens, the mechanism of action, although it's been used for a long, long time, also the mechanism of action is not completely known, but they think that exposing these uh, cells to the active T cells of the uh, donor to the ultraviolet light will cause apoptosis. When they're exposed to the APCs, they can cause some kind of colorism and uh, more uh, T-rex that will decrease the graft versus host disease. We actually have study here, we're trying to uh, do the immune regulation of T uh, uh, profiling of the T cells. So ECP, it's well tolerated, less immune suppression, so less infection for this patient and um, for us, which is important, less tumor recurrence. Not sure about patients who have HCC and others, maybe also it helps less tumor recurrence. Side effects, I mean, most of them are very, really minor. Some uh, hypotension, some uh, transient fever, six to eight hours. Um, of course, they need a catheter, so there's risk of catheter infection and cataracts, so they need to wear their protective glasses. So after treatment, um, so the patients who are fortunate enough to survive, most of them, they have these symptoms that goes back and forth, skin rash, diarrhea, typically continue. They relapse and remit every now and then. But chronic GVAC is not that documented. Very rarely cases are uh, documented for chronic GVAC after a solid organ transplant. Basically, it's like autoimmune disease. They can get uh, alopecia, they can get fibrosis, um, but it's very rare uh, after, or at least the documented cases are very rare in the literature. Um, so how these patients will do? Are they gonna do okay? Are they gonna die? Is there something that we can look at to see if they're gonna have a bad prognosis or poor prognosis? Again, few series looked at this, and if you look at these series, there are different uh, 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 conclusions because it's all retrospective, few, few patients, but you can see at um, some of the, I'm gonna just look, show you the significant ones here, at least in this one, survivors versus fatal outcome, they looked at uh, skin alone was, was better. This one says fever at presentation was bad, and um, then subse subsequent fever was bad, but others, like if you look at the cytopenias, uh, days from uh, a, a presentation uh, of transplant to diagnosis is not that significant. However, if you look at another study, um, if you look at fever, it is significant, but if you look at the multivariate analysis, it's not. And then if you look something that uh, 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 stayed as the uh, um, significant even after the multivariable analysis is um, the age difference, difference between the patient and the recipient. This is just, this is from the same case series. They looked at the pancytopenia, so the pancytopenia negative did better than 
uh, the positive pancytopenia, but I agree that pancytopenia is definitely a poor prognostic factor. And then also here the idea, but in the multivariable analysis, this was not significant. So very important also when we start these patients on immunosuppressive medication, preventing infection is as important as starting the treatment because most patients actually the cause of death in the GVHD after solid organ transplants like stem cell transplant is actually the infections, not the GVHD itself. So uh, infection prophylaxis is very important. They also can have bleeding and multi-organ failure. Also other supportive measure is like GTFF can help any drugs that can uh, cause cytopenias, we can stop um, and try to start treatment before we get to the point of pancytopenia. Okay, I tried to finish less than 30 minutes there. Although GVHD is rare, but mortality is very high, it's very important. Um, it's very important for early diagnosis. It's very heterogeneous disease. You have a lot of factors, the patient, the recipient, the microbiome, the immune suppression, so a lot of heterogeneity. So a lot of polytherapeutic agents to appear next in the future. So we'll leave half an hour for questions. Yeah, very good question. Sure. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I put this to mention the other ones: the anti-leukin two, anti-T cells, the Tuximab, anti-ATG. So, all of them are options, and all of them are were used at least in the literature for these patients. But if you look at these numbers of patients, like probably like ATG, maybe the whole literature of 20 got it. Uh, in uh, like uh, basiliximab or basiliximab, so probably you're gonna find 10 who got it. And it's very difficult to, you know, to say conclusions like, oh, this one helps, this doesn't help. It's a very small number to draw conclusions. Yes, it is anti-B cell. Yes, so this is one of the important thing is that probably I didn't mention a lot about both B cells, but now we know that B cells also contribute a lot to GVHD, not only T cells. That's why rituximab, we use it in some of the stem cell transplants and they try to use it in some of the solid organ as, but probably again, it's probably two patients. But even if our stem cell transplant rituximab, I mean, it helps, but it's not the best. But we know that B cells contribute to GVHD, but we need, I think we need a better medication anti-B cells to GVHD than rituximab. So yes, there are, I, but again, it's only case reports. So I'm not sure about uh, specifically for when you have, I, I know the patient you're talking about, if there is a difference um, for those specific patients that rejecting their graft, that I don't know. Because all these are immunosuppressive uh, medications. They all cause, gonna cause immunosuppression. So the sub no. So most of them are uh, the ones I mentioned are specifically for the liver and the small intestine that I mentioned. So the difference between the inside the organ because li uh, because the small intestine and liver is like a lymph node. So they have more like uh, NK T cells, the, uh, the NKs with the T uh, sorry T cells with the NK receptors and reversal of the CD4 CD8 ratio. But the heart and the lung, I've actually they think it's less number of T cells compared 
uh, to if they're uh, lymph nodes versus not lymph nodes. But anyways, most of these organs, they have more a peripheral tissue and lymph node tissue than peripheral blood composition. Because what happens when the T cells, they go into uh, the lymph nodes, the liver, they, mo they get modified and then they go into uh, like the organs. Yes. Yes. So, so yeah, as I mentioned, actually, most of these patients that I mentioned, all of these, the the peripheral and uh, stem, uh, peripheral STR is almost negative in all of them. So, so it's better to 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 check it in the organ that's affected. So, most of them will have like. 90% of patients will have skin rash, so it's very specific, very sensitive. So just a skin biopsy is very easy to do and send it to, uh, uh, to our path, uh, like pathology and HMA lab. And probably, as you know, for this patient, it was negative, but we know when you have such a high suspicion, it's very specific sensitive, you just have to make sure how she has, they have a good specimen. Oh, just cytopenia? Yes, so uh, first to have only pancytopenia is going to be only 4% of cases because 94% will, will have rash. But yes, if it's only pancytopenia, then uh, after we're stopping medication, there is still cytopenia, then yes, bone marrow and check STR in the bone marrow. You have to, uh, to have to check the organ that's affected. So if it's just such opinions, you can do bone marrow, but you're right. That's why if you look at your nurse registry, it's gonna be only 0.1% patients has GPHT. If you go, go to case reports and case review, it's one to 2%. So it is definitely underdiagnosed people probably dying without even knowing. But if any manifestation you think in that, sorry, that period of time, that goes for any manifestation, pancytopenia, even just fever. Some people have just fever without anything else. Um, if infections are negative, just keep it in your back mind and then try to, whatever organ you think is affected, you have to check. If nothing, then it has to be peripheral blood and you have to try to get peripheral blood. If it's cytopenia, then you have to check bone marrow. So, so, um, so there is difference, so it has to be symptomatic. So you can have like uh, even like, p usually they say for transplant patient after years, they will have, uh, I don't know, other types of cells in certain organs. So it has to be symptomatic and you have to find that. So you have to combination of both. They have to be symptomatic. You have especially that period of time when there's high risk for GVHD and then, you know, the chimeras, whatever organ is affected. But, but there is, as I mentioned, you can have, if you, you check your transplant patients, two weeks after all of them, they will have uh, donor cells. That's normal. 
they're, they're not going to have, and probably if you check patients who live, you know, five, ten years, you do, I don't know, their heart biopsies or liver biopsies, you're going to find some kind of uh, donor stem cells there. That's okay. But it has to be with symptoms. You have to have, so it's either because it's a battle between the two. So either it's going to be tolerance, it's going to be rejection, or UVHD. So you have to have the combination symptoms and chimerism. Oh, definitely, for sure. And they're working on more specific, even this SDR is like 1% is, is actually not that sensitive and not that sensitive. So they're working on better SDRs, the way to detect. Even for us, it's very important because also SDR make, means, uh, mixed means relapse of the disease. And 1% is too high. That means the disease is already back and we missed it. So one person is not, not good. We need even better, and they're working on that. 